Discussion, the scribes speak. Uh, excuse me for reading this, there's just a lot going on. In the spirit of the Union of Festival celebration of the playwright's voice, we've assembled a panel of writers to discuss some of the issues and questions most pressing in their minds today. The initial inspiration for holding a forum that features playwrights grew out of an initiative during Actors Theatre's recent leadership transition. 
the theatre gathered a national playwright advisory team comprised of seven festival alumni to weigh in at several key points during the artistic director search that led to me being here. <laughs> They were invited to participate in the interview process and also to engage in candid conversation about the festival and the field with our artistic staff. Hearing their thoughts was incredibly val valuable, well it was to me, and we, <laughs> so, we wanted to open that door a little wider and keep listening to playwrights in a different, even larger context. Uh, though today's conversation takes us in another direction, Several of today's panelists have served as our advisor, and we thank all of these wonderful writers for lending their voices to this panel. We also have here the very wonderful Emily Morse, the Director of Artistic Development and Youth Dramatists, and she's the moderator for this discussion. Uh, so today's panel has been streamed live on the internet through New Play TV, a project of HowlRound.com, and we'll also be taking questions live via Twitter. For those watching this at home, please tag your questions with Pound Hugh Manifest. And after the panel, we encourage you to keep the conversation going by finding us on Twitter, Facebook, or logging on to actorstheatre.org. And that's enough from me, and over to these guys. <laughs> Try to do this without a mic, if, if that's okay, or, or maybe if this is enough. Can you guys hear me? Great. Um, so thank you, Les. Uh, good morning. It's an honor to be here. Um, first of all, I was a literary uh, dramaturgy intern here in 1990-91, uh, so attending the event. <laughs> uh, it feels like a homecoming. And second of all, who wouldn't want to spend an hour with these accomplished, innovative uh, theater artists in the company of all of you having a conversation uh, about leadership. Um, I'm going to introduce these wonderful people. You have bios and you can read about them uh, and follow their work, please. But for the purposes of now, to uh, my left, I have Stephen Sapp. Uh, among his many credits is the co-founder of The Point Community Development Corporation, uh, which is dedicated to youth development and the cultural and economic revitalization of the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx. He's also, obviously, a member of Universes, which is a wonderful ensemble. Um, a company whose work has uh, been produced here, um, among other places. Um, we have Anne Washburn, whose play at Double at Noon premiered at the 2011 Humana Festival. In addition to her numerous bio credits, Anne has been a mentor to many early career writers. She also originated the Pataphysics <coughs> Pad of Physics playwriting workshops at the Fleet Theater, which are intimate four session intensives for new work and new ways of working led by master playwrights. Uh, then we have Molly Smith Metzler, uh, whose sharp comedy, The Element of Pia, was featured in the 2011 <laughs> Humana Festival. And additionally, I found out by reading an interview with playwright Adam Simkowitz that she and her siblings started a theater troupe as kids. She was also one of the producers of the Lily Awards. Um, Greg Kotis play uh, Michael von Siebenberg, melts through the first <coughs> awards just opened yesterday at the 2012 Humana Festival. Woo! <laughs> was defined by his involvement with the Cardiff uh, Giant Theatre Company and the Neo Futurists, both ensemble based companies uh, or companies based in Chicago. And then of course at the end here we have Adam Rapp, whose play The Edge of Our Bodies was featured in the 2011 Humana Festival. He's also a director of his own work and the work of others, including film as well. So uh, to start us off this morning, I just, as Les mentioned, I work at New Dramatist, which is an artistic home and laboratory for playwrights located in an old church in Midtown Manhattan. And we support playwrights through free seven-year residencies, during which time each writer drives their own artistic development. For seven years, they have unlimited access to space, time, <coughs> artistic collaborators, advocacy, free copies, and of course, each other. 
Uh, we refer to them as the artistic directors of their residencies, and because of the variety of artistic and career goals, working style, personalities, curiosities, that means the organization is supporting about 50 different artistic directions, because that's about how many resident playwrights we have at any given time. We also foster peer and community involvement as that's one of the founding principles of the dramatists that playwrights are each other's greatest resource. Unfortunately, the organization is nimble enough to be responsive to the individual as well as the collective needs of our playwrights. And in fact, the playwrights are in many respects the policy makers of the organization itself. We have a writer's executive committee to whom we take organizational matters for their input and often decision making. And four members of the writer's exec also sit on our board of directors and act as liaisons between the board and the artistic community. A topic that has been brewing at New Dramatists of late is playwright leadership. And what does it mean to be a leader? Not only of their own work and development, but a field leader as well. And as itinerant artists, playwrights have unique perspectives on the field. They've worked in and experienced their work in a variety of venues in front of, a diverse, of diverse audiences across the country. And that's why it's so cool that the playwrights were part of the, um, the search committee for the new ATL artistic director, right? I mean, they know a thing or two um, based on their own experiences. They're also creators of worlds, so taking that creative impulse and tapping their wisdom I've asked them to apply it to the field and imagine their dream theaters. What would their theater look like if they could build or run one? What is their vision for theater, programming, space, community, audience? So I'm going to, they're going to talk about that. And, uh, and, uh, and then we'll have to take questions from, from me. Uh, yeah, Stephen. I have one of the mics. Oh, here, here. <laughs> They're rock stars. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's one of these you never want to go first, but I am first. Um, you know, I feel like I've created um, my own dream theater. Um, in 1993-94, um, myself and three friends of mine, um, we were working in uh, social service. Um, teaching reading, write, reading and writing to the community in, in the South Bronx. And um, we, we used to walk by this abandoned building every day. And it was an abandoned bagel factory. Um, when I mean literally, when we went in the building, they were old, fossilized bagels. And, um, <laughs> um, but we decided to, that it would be great if we had, because there were no theaters in the South Bronx, or in the Bronx really at all. So we decided to take over the building. We went to the landlord. And we say, look, you're paying, you're paying property tax on a building that you're not even using. Um, so he said, well, you guys can come in and renovate if you want. So he gave us a year to renovate the space um, and have stuff going and raise money. Um, and if we didn't, then he would take the building back. And whatever we did, we would just basically lose. And we said yes. <laughs> um, so we went into the building. Um, and it took us a year to renovate the building. But what was amazing, what happened was, the people from the community got very curious about these crazy kids that were in there renovating this old abandoned bagel factory. So the woman who lived next door threw her holes over the wall. So we had water um, for her. Um, the kids from the community would come and help us do cleanup. There was a guy who worked um, as a mechanic. He would bring old hammers and screws. Um, we went to the Pratt Institute and they came and did pro bono. Um, they sketched out the building and then they literally drew on the floor where the walls would go. It looked like a big giant jigsaw puzzle. And we hired one general contractor um, with our own money who hired two guys off the books. Um, and then us, and I know nothing about sheetrock walls, and, but I know now, um, and we literally <laughs> renovated the entire space. 12,000 square foot building, 4,000 square feet of it was the theater itself. The other the rest of the building we changed, we turned into businesses. So we had a restaurant, and everyone was, all of them was run by people from the community. We had a restaurant, we had a barber shop, we had a record store, we had a computer center, we had a dance studio in the back, um, and it all, and we had one anchor tenant, which was a sort of a social service agency in, in, in Hunts Point. And between them, they paid the rent. So the theater itself did not have to generate huge amount of funds to function. Light was paid for, we had food, free food from the restaurant, um, and we ran programming. So for me, 
to interact with the community, I needed to know, besides just doing the theater stuff as a theater person, what else needed to happen, go on in that space to connect with the community. So literally we had Gay Men of the Bronx had their whole balls going on in, 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 in the space. We had poetry readings, we had comedy night, we had, um, besides doing theater runs, um, one woman who lived in the community, and she came to me and said, you know, my daughter's getting married, and I don't have any place to have the wedding reception. And I was literally sitting going, please don't ask me to put the wedding reception in the <laughs> Please. And she said, well, I, you know, is there any way? And so we kind of worked out something. And literally the space turned into that also. So we had, I've had Sweet Sixteens in the building. Um, but we ran that space um, sort of as you would, you know, literally, literally dealing with the community. So a variety of different ways that people would interact with us as a space and to see the businesses operating was a really nice, beautiful way to kind of interact. And I really feel like a lot of times when I travel nowadays, you go to a lot of theaters and they seem like museums. They just feel like they're always a step behind or it's so sort of sacred or the regular kid from the block um, who live in certain communities would not come to a show because they don't feel connected to it at all. I don't, and it happens all the time where you show up somewhere and all of a sudden all the quote unquote hip hop flyers go out to all the, the black and Latino communities and they start running to the theater begging to see students to come see a show where they've never come to your space before. They've never interacted with you before that way. But here you come now running like this um, and expect them to show up. So for me, running that space, we made sure that what was going on around us was in the space. And then artistically, that the space had to be run and looked like a professional space. So anyone who came from the downtown scene or the theater scene would walk in and they'd be like, oh shit, you guys have real stuff. And yeah, a light board. Um, and I really <laughs> so for me, that was my sort of, that was my ideal of a dream space. Um, and it's still running now to this day, since 1993, and the South Bronx is still running. Um, and also see theaters try to stretch how they do programming. Um, and how they interact with spaces the same way. So, thank you. Um, my, my idea is, uh, it's my lottery money idea. <laughs> which I was going to try to modify for this. I wanted to come up with something a little less particular, but I found that I kept thinking obsessively about black boxes and second spaces, and so, take it sort of that like it's a secret dinner theater and I'm not going to talk about the dinner part of it because that's sort of complex but it's uh, <laughs> it's basically a, an intimate space no more than 150 maybe 99 um, the, the whole thing of it really is to get um, an audience that is as alert and active and interested and engaged and engageable as possible sort of a way to create the ideal audience which every playwright needs to balance their play against so the theater is um, by invite only. You can apply to come be a subscriber. There's very active recruiting. The goal is to get at least half of the audience people who are not regular theater goers, because that's just a different kind of attention. Half the audience people who are regular theater goers, but people from really all over the place. And there's a lottery money, money funding aspect to it, so the ticket prices are um, all over the map, but also affordable. Um, it's a season of five playwrights, some of which are extremely established, some of which are very much emerging. The playwright, um, I come from a theater collective called 13P, and at 13P, the playwright is the artistic director for their particular show. They select the director, they can control the marketing if they would like, they can select the poster design. Um, and that's been really inspiring, and I think has actually worked out very well. Uh, each play is such a particular ethos really the playwright in a certain sense is the person who maybe has the best sense of how to communicate that all the way down the chain. Um, so that would very much be part of it. Uh, play uh, posters would be very much um, different for every show, really reflecting every show. Um, you would come in, you would do your dinner thing, which I'm not going to talk about. You would um, see the play, you would not know who the play was by, you would not know who any of the plays were by. Um, at the end of the night, you would be given a program with the director and the actors, but not the playwright. You would never know who the playwright was. <laughs> the show would not be reviewed. Um, <laughs> it would be a wait for simultaneous 
basically for um, emerging writers to get a really good production without the pressure of critical response. Um, it would also be a way for super established writers to, you know, test a show out without that kind of, a, you know, something that maybe uh, is not what they normally do, or just a way for them to see it, and then they can go up later on. So if you're an audience for this uh, theater, you might recognize later on and find out at that point who shows were by, you might never know. It also means the audience has to bring a kind of attention to it, knowing that this could be, you know, a play by anyone. It could be a play by someone super famous, it might be a play by someone super new. You just have to really pay that kind of attention to it. So that's, I think, the basic, just their nitty details. <laughs> <laughs> but if I like gun to my head had to devise what to do with the money myself. Um, you know, I've I've just had my first New York production, which is um, a very a very different thing. And I've had wonderful regional productions and had a, had a great experiences. And anyway, so what's on my mind a lot these days is is New York and ushering plays to New York in a way that protects plays and, and makes them positive and also makes them playwrights centered. Um, and so in that vein, I think what I would do with the money is start a regional theater um, that has a deep, wonderful relationship with the New York theater, and that they would work together in partnership. Um, and the idea would be to commission a handful of writers for a four-year plan. The first year is just, I'm going to commission you, I'm going to salary you and give you health insurance, and you are now in residence at your will. If you want to come to the theater, you can also write in Alaska, but like it's up to you where you write the play. But you are an employee of the theater, of this regional theater. First season, I would do a reading of the play. Second season, I would do a workshop for the play. Third season, I would do a production of the play. And the fourth season, I would bring it into New York. All with the same director, so that there's a sense of getting that play right, nurturing that play, getting that play into New York in a positive and comfortable and like really great way. So that's that's what I would do. And I would commission four writers a year and so that there's always four going. You know? Anyway, so that's kind of practical. But my other thing, I build a theater right next door, um, which is just for comedy. I'm a little yeah. I'm really <laughs> I'm a little I'm a little concerned. I don't mean dramatic comedy or you know, play beautiful plays with a little comedy in it. I mean, like, capital C comedy, like, you know, boulevard comedy, farce. Like, where are these plays going? They're getting demolished in New York, and then no one does them. And I'm really worried. I feel like Wendy Wasserstein and Neil Simon and Chris Durang, they would not get to have the careers today that they did then. It's just sort of, comedy has really changed. So I would find all my funniest friends, commission them, and take them to my theater, and, and really support capital C comedy. Hi, hello. Um, uh, I, uh, I came up um, in the improv scene in Chicago, uh, and that was a big part of my experience and my, my, formative, uh, my formative time. And there are um, there's things that happen in the improv comedy world. Uh, in particular, I think of uh, the Annoyance Theater in Chicago, if you know that, that company. Uh, Second City is um, you know, the most famous established institutional improv-based theater. And in New York, there's the Upright Citizens Brigade, Magnet Theater, uh, People's Improv Theater, that kind of stuff. Um, and the thing that they can do, which is great, is that they collect a large community of creators. You know, as an improviser, you go up and you do a scene, and you are the author and the performer of the scene simultaneously. And they have shows going constantly. They have what you could call original, original theater pieces um, at every hour of the day sometimes, um, into, into the late evening. And the, the heart of each of those theaters is the community that is sort of collected around them, starting with what might be a main stage ensemble and then other sort of, uh, um, I think at, uh, I forget what it's called, Second City, but they have like a second stage. And they have touring companies, and then they also have lots of classes. You know, it's really a school of that kind of performance. So uh, what, I, what I think would be great, and I don't even know if it's possible or not, but if it's somehow possible to marry that kind of energy and that kind of inclusive, um, I don't want to say disposable, but just sort of um, uh, careless, reckless sort of creation of new work, 
together with some of the production values and broader aesthetic of, of the theater world, of, I guess the legit theater world, that could be great, um, where you have classes going on all the time, people learning, um, you know, playwrights of every, of every, every level, um, writing and creating scripts, and that you have runs of, of plays for whatever, you know, short periods of time, long periods of time, doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, if, if, if the, the logistics are complicated, but the, the culture of the improv world, I think, has something to teach the culture of the theater world in terms of just the, the, the rawness of it, which can be really fantastic and really great. Um, and then to be specific, I think my theater would be on 4th Street in Lower Manhattan, just because I love that street. <laughs> well, it might be like, you know, second and third where you know, the workshop is. And, you know, I, I did a play at the New York Fringe Festival this summer, um, and we were on that street. And the great thing is, is, you go, you see a play, you walk out on the street, and there are audiences spilling out from all the other plays that are happening simultaneously. So that commingling of all the different audiences um, on that particular street in New York is really exciting to me. Or if there are other, if there are other streets like it, then, then I would like to be on that kind of street. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always really deeply concerned with uh, like the, where the new audience is coming from and <coughs> having lived in New York for the last 20 years and um, having been in a band and having written plays and written books and stuff, there's, um, there's an energy and a vitality to certain kinds of spaces and we've all kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, one of my favorite spaces in New York uh, that doesn't exist anymore where, where, where it used to be it was called the Knitting Factory. And um, there were three levels, and there were three different stages where, you could, where bands would perform, and they had like um, some larger bands, some smaller indie bands, and then sometimes they would have jazz, jazz quartets. And but there was a life in that space that was um, really exciting. And the thing that was the most exciting thing about that space was the um, audience uh, was probably between the ages of, you know, 16 and 55. Um, and I think what helped that a lot was that tickets were rarely over $15. So um, those are two things that are really interesting to me, is to create a disposable income theater um, in which you're basically going to spend the same amount that you would to download a record, um, meaning $10, $15, something, something like that. So the, the space, the, the, my dream space would be a, a place that has a black box theater, um, of a film space and a rock and roll space and that you have the intersection of those three different audiences um, constantly cross-pollinating with each other like when you come out from a film you see somebody lining up for the theater piece and maybe there's a bookstore that's also a coffee shop. Um, I think the Royal, the Royal Court does a really nice job of creating a lot of culture in their building. I was just there a couple weeks ago and um, they have a great bookstore, they have a great cafe, There's writers in the space all the time, like talking and writing and people, there's just a real, um, uh, there's volume there of, of people and, and youth and, and older people and anyway, that was really exciting. The thing that I would do in terms of programming is I would um, assign artists to curate each space. So there would be a rotating curator, so for instance, um, Ann Washburn would be the film curator and she would select her three favorite films that she would show on a Saturday night. And then um, I would ask someone like Richard Maxwell to program um, a theater season where in our black box space uh, he would be able to install either his work or, or the work of someone he, he admired or someone he would commission. Um, then in, in the rock and roll space we would have somebody curating that, some, some other interesting artist like uh, a novelist or, a, you know, a, a, or like Lou Reed or someone. Um, I just think like having um, Curating each space is a really interesting thing because then nothing gets uh, stale or nothing gets uh, uh, too one-dimensional in terms of um, somebody's taste. I think there's a, a really interesting um, variety possible. In the, in the theater space, what I would do is I would want to have enough money where I could actually pay for a resident company. And so actors would get paid $50,000 and they would get benefits. And they would be devoting themselves to at least three weeks of a development piece and 10 weeks of a run. So they could go off and do TV and film and do other, other things, but they would have to give us 
uh, 10 weeks of a run or, and three weeks of development. It's not a lot, and then they get um, insurance. And Because I feel like the other thing that happens in New York, at least, is that all the great actors that you come up with, who um, you develop your work with, they can't afford to economically to be in New York and do theater anymore, so they wind up going away and to the West Coast, or they start doing film and TV, and, and you're constantly begging them to slum in the theater again. Um, so I would try to figure out a way that economically that it would keep those people interested in continuing to do theater, because we want to have kids and we want to have, you know, sofas and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, that's basically it. Uh, um, the, other thing I would, the other thing I would do, and, and then I'll shut up, the other thing I would do is, um, in the black box space, um, uh, three times a week, led by a, a writer, there would be writers writing for three hours. <coughs> like, you know, on the night off or the dark night and maybe, you know, at three available hours on Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, people would come and write in the space. Like, we would have desks, and, uh, like, we would have 50 people, and then someone would lead uh, a, a writing session or workshops or uh, pataphysics or, you know, so that there was, there was work always happening in a space, because I think it's sad when spaces just are, are museums. You know, I think it's sad, so I would try to keep a lot of uh, energy in the space going. That's it. Well, when I was there, they were doing a 100-word play festival, okay. um, and they were like, I was just down, I was like talking to the literary manager, and, and, and three or four tables kind of sectioned off. It was their youth writing group, and they were like doing 100-word plays, and they were, there was a big bulletin board with like cards on it, and they were just like writing, and it, you felt writing happening, which I thought was really, really exciting. I mean, it's interesting because at New Dramatist, that's always been a dream was to get more writers writing in the building, and it was simply reconfiguring, I mean, in addition to Wi-Fi, <coughs> it was reconfigu reconfiguring the library with um, different kinds of desktops that were movable within the, the, the kind of living room furniture we have, reconfiguring our, uh, what was a classroom space that was once a sort of long, very ornate table, we created more modular furniture, and it's, we have people writing in the building all the time, and often writers within given certain rooms together because they just want to write in the company of each other. So I think that's, that seems like a great achievable idea for the spaces that we already um, operate. Um, thank you very much. This is Wonderful to hear from all of you. Um, I'm curious to know, um, in addition to the curatorial model, would that well, would that change annually, or how? Would that yeah, I would basically I would assign curators, and then I would hand off. I would I would start the whole thing and start the building, and then I would I would I would pick the first three curators for the first season, and then I would step down as the overall curator, and I would just I would produce. This. I would just help be an administrator, and then I would, that would rotate. I just think rotating is good. Thank you. In addition to that, I, I'm curious to hear, because I think that's uh, a question too, and you've certainly been on um, the decision side of things, like how would you program, how would you choose the writers uh, for your not dinner, non dinner theater? Um, how, what would that, how would that work? And I want to hear from others as well, the programming aspect of it. Um, you want? <laughs> um, I really like this idea of rotating. Um, I mean, I have a little list in my head <laughs> of plays that I think are fabulous and haven't been done, or people I think are fabulous and would love to see up. Do you yeah. want to say some of them? Oh, I would, I, you know, no, because I would end up leaving someone off and then I would feel tragic about it. Um, <laughs> you know, so there are a lot of really strong, and some of them are people who are done, and it would just be great to give them a chance to do it in that sort of way and with that audience, and some of them are people who haven't been done yet and are fabulous. and and all of that. So no, I have a list that I would go through, but um, I like very much this idea of, of rotating curatorship and shifting vision because I feel like, you know, you do eventually, uh, you get worried programming. So I think having having different voices coming and having a shift is a, is a great, I would steal from all of these ideas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, we should all be stealing. <laughs> Oh, I'm just laughing at the worry. I think that's right. It's it's so true, and, and it, it is. It's just interesting that there's some some people will program theaters for 
40 years. I'm going to a 40th anniversary party for an artistic director in a couple of weeks and a half. And it's, it, it is, it's a big responsibility, but also it's, it's, it's scary. I think it might be fun to rotate. We should all rotate. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I really respond to what you were saying, Molly, about comedy and comedy and theater. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be great to create a theater in terms of, the, the, in terms of programming the, the authors that were all sort of somehow committed to the idea of comedy and the theater in their own particular way. And I think it does feel, it, it, yeah, I, 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 I agree with what you're saying about um, comedy is often being reduced to sitcom, maybe because that's like an easy way to describe it or something. Um, but it, it, the, the energy and the uh, electricity that can be created uh, through comedy is just, you know, it's a great thing, um, as, is, as, as is drama and all the rest of it. So, but to create a, a theater that can create comedy and, and just sort of explore the idea of that, you know, that is um, neither sitcom nor uh, 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 Forrest or whatever, to sort of to, to explore and experiment what else it is and what is this, what is this you know, primate sound that we make when we laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's universal. It's, it is, every culture has it. I have read on the internet. <laughs> we all make it, you know. And so, uh, just that, the fact of that, make it sort of a research and development um, institution for what makes us laugh be great. in the theater would be great. <laughs> um, how do you find artists? I think, one, it, it can't be in the traditional way that playwrights and artists get quote unquote discovered or work. Um, you have to go out and see stuff and bring people who haven't necessarily arrived, or like I said, in the traditional, they won't get here. Um, they don't, they haven't figured out how to get to a new dramatist or uh, a Humana Festival. They, have, they, they haven't figured that out. So are you that place that can help them get, their, some, get themselves launched? Do you sit and have discussion when I, we go out and we do workshops, and they usually bring you in to do, you know, you do your writing or show people how to do theater. Half of our workshop also is how do you survive doing this? What other networks exist besides the regional theater world or even just doing New York? Um, are there performance spaces? Are there colleges? Um, NPN, the National Performance Network, has a network of, of places you can and travel. The network of ensemble theaters for ensemble theaters. Um, are you? empowering artists that way um, to be able to not necessarily need the traditional way of working and to survive and be an artist nowadays because it's it's hard. You cannot just rely, if you, if you get produced one year and you feel very happy and very full of yourself, we all know next year you may not get produced. Um, so how are you, or if you happen to do a show that gets a bad review and you know, is your career over? Or are you finding other ways to continue to work that when the quote unquote bigger theaters find you, um, you already have figured out what your aesthetic is, how you work, who you want to work with, um, and how to be able to function and move around the country as an artist, and be able to teach and train how that works. Besides just the usual, this is how you write a play, this is how a, a theater ensemble works. As, as we all know, there's much more that goes to that um, with an agent and without an agent. Um, how do you have a career and be able to function and move around without having that type of access? Um, I uh, have a question uh, to ask the panel um, on behalf of Todd London, who's the artistic director at, at New Dramatist and, and um, my colleague. Uh, he wrote, because uh, we we've been having this conversation, so he texted me, I think it was five texts, um, the question, uh, where he says, so I'm posing this to you, um, historically playwrights have led theaters and the art. Currently, TV entrusts huge budget shows to the leadership of writers, yet theaters do not perceive playwrights as serious choices to run them. Um, or they do not perceive them as leaders of people as directors are or as fundraisers as producers are. 
Uh, they want to ask, they ask about your writing and your solitude and how can you focus on the work of others. Even playwright artistic directors to, tend to be directors um, also. How do you address that? And what can you as playwrights do together to change these perceptions? And then to the fields, how can the field work with the managers and boards who make these decisions to open up the thinking about who can hold a leadership position in an organization or an institution? <laughs> um, well, I think, yeah, I would love to run a theater. And um, I would, um, one thing that I think that we're really good at is reading plays. And we, we know the mechanics of plays. We know how to interact with audiences. Whether we direct or don't, don't direct, we understand the culture of the theater. It's, it's astonishing to me. I know that Richard Nelson, when I worked with him, I taught at Yale for a year, and he was, he was the chair, and he talked a lot about this very subject. And he thought, you know, part of it was he was talking about being employed by a theater beyond just being a, a, a writer for hire coming in to do your play, to actually have benefits. He, was, he talks a lot about comparing the salaries you know, from the artistic director, if you really compare it to the playwright who comes in to do one show for a season, it's pretty remarkable what the difference is in terms of percentage of income and benefits and all this other stuff. But he was also talking about leadership in theater, and um, I love the way he, he talked about, you know, writers should be running theaters. Um, and not just, like I know Richard Maxwell pretty well, and he runs uh, the New York City Players, and, you know, it, it, it can come off like a vanity thing, but he does a lot of community outreach. He, he does. He, he, um, he produces his work, but he also um, produces other people's work now. He goes into prisons, he goes to McDonald's, and he finds people who are interested in making theater. You know, he does really interesting things with the community. Um, I think it's not done enough. I think playwrights should be running theaters. And I know that Lee Blessing at one point was up for the job at the O'Neill, and I thought it was a tragedy that he didn't get picked. Um, you, you know, here's a man who had been at the O'Neill 12 times. He's, he was a great teacher. He teaches at Rutgers. He's a, one of our emeritus playwrights. Um, he's worked with everybody you can imagine in every theater you can imagine. He's worked here several times. Um, and why, why didn't he get selected? I don't know. They, they chose a, a very talented young director to run the place. But I, I thought, you know, why not have a playwright running the National Playwrights Conference? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it's really important. I think people should start stepping up and I wish that um, someone would give me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, I was thinking about that too, and I think in some of the things that uh, Greg, you had said um, in, in our uh, email discussions about today and this topic and things that have been said today, I mean, I wonder too if there, there are ways, uh, again, pointing out the way that Actors Theater uh, created an advisory committee of playwrights in relationship to the, the artistic director search. I wonder if that's also where else can artists be within the organizations in addition to uh, the productions and, and when they come into, when they're hired to come in and work on a show? I mean, can they, are there board positions for them? Are there selection committees that can, where those skills and insights be used uh, within an organization in addition to just the show on which they are brought into work? So other thoughts about that? And, I mean, and too, there's the PT as a model. And, um, Sure. Um, I mean, I myself, I'm not a good leader. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be an organization, but I'm a very good structurer. Mm -hmm. um, but I know many playwrights who are, you know, very good, strong leaders. I think a lot about Shakespeare, mm -hmm. writing for a theater in which he had a financial stake. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think some playwrights totally ready and able and willing to lead. Other playwrights may be involved in structuring and, uh, in a kind of a shareholder situation, I think is also a really positive way of involvement. That's great. And also, I, mean, I think the, um, I mean, <coughs> for me starting out the, in, in storefront theater in Chicago, um, the, the uh, distinction between a writer and a performer and a director was really blurry. Yeah. You know, people were neither one nor the other and all together. And, it, and I don't think, <laughs> It was maybe a, a product of where we were coming from, but it didn't occur to us to make that distinction. And you would have, you know, it could be problematic because you'd be in rehearsal and an actor would stop the rehearsal and start to give notes and whatever. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, that was our culture. Um, but yeah, it, 
didn't, I mean, I think that part of uh, my experience um, having the opportunity to work in uh, professional theaters or, or theaters that are better funded or institutional theaters is that there is um, a real importance in making those distinctions that I didn't, didn't occur to me should be made earlier. And so I think, you know, it's like that spectrum thing, like everybody's not entirely gay or straight kind of thing. It's sort of, there's a lot of gray area in between, I've heard. Um, <laughs> so, you know, or rather totally male or totally female, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think directors, there is something in the wiring of good directors where they are natural leaders. And there is, and among their other, other qualities, where it is easy for them to move from one department to the other in terms of just a, a big production. Um, and there is something um, about playwrights that is, there's a, there's, you have to be able, you don't have to, but you find yourself in a room alone with your own thoughts for hours on end, and you have to be able to sort of do that, um, which is a little hard. So I think they are, there is something to the difference between the pure playwright and the pure director, but I don't think, I think we're all sort of in between. Directors write their own stuff, playwrights direct their own stuff. And so maybe, um, maybe uh, the label is a little bit of a barrier sometimes. So. I think um, because, I, I, because I ran a space really early in my career before my company even um, was developed, because of running the space early, when we left our space and I really just focused my attention on the company, when I started to deal with other theaters and agents and artistic directors, I was able to have a conversation with them in a way that a lot of them weren't expecting to have. If you're sitting there and you're talking about budget and you know and you're really, really engaged with them in budget conversations, it's a different conversation you're having with someone when they're negotiating with you when you can really sit down and break down a budget with them. Like, no 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 what why is that there? And so I think as we've gone on and moved on, I think what we have managed to kind of carve out is because of having that experience of running my own space and having to fundraise and having to interact um, with audiences. Um, so when I'm out as a, just an artist, my brain is still in that mode anyway. So we were just in Victory Gardens in Chicago. I knew that besides the usual way that they were gonna promote, that we had to go out as my company. So every poetry spot in Chicago, we hit, because we knew we had to kind of go bigger than that. We were flooded Facebook and Twitter. We had to assist in being um, a presence in Chicago because Chicago, especially Victory Gardens, they were very sort of traditional theater audience. And my aesthetic and what my company does was shocking to some of them. Um, <laughs> it's funny when you walk out and you start doing something and within the first two minutes of opening your mouth, someone is running out of the room. You're like, wow. <laughs> Like two minutes, like we thought they were, oh shit, no, and like, like wow, that's deep. But, uh, <laughs> but I will say, did I curse? I'm sorry. Um, but um, I will say, because um, we were out and about in a variety of different ways, there was a whole crop of people that came from the Green Mill to see the show that would not have come to see the show at all. Um, there's a couple of hip-hop radio stations we hit late at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, we hit it just to kind of do it. That came to see the show. So when we're standing on stage and we're looking at, at the audience, it's an interesting, diverse group of people. And that's how I feel theater should be. So you got half the room that's laughing at something, and the other half is looking on why are they laughing. And then you got the other half that's looking and they're going, why are they laughing? Um, but it's this weird, eclectic group of people in the room. Um, who've paid a variety of different prices to sit and enjoy theater. And I think, I personally think artists, as much as they can, be involved in decision-making processes and seeing how the mechanics of things work. Because when you're asking for stuff, like, I want this to happen now, and if you have no concept, like, to do this, it impacts this, 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 and this. Um, if you're not thinking along that line, you don't, you know, you, you can't really, I feel, truly impact what's going on. So, it's, so it's, it's, it works on so many different levels. Um, and I think 
running a theater, being involved in that only helps the art. And, and to be able to help other artists coming up behind you, to be able to tell them, do this, please, oh God, don't do that. <laughs> That was something that had come up at Andromedus once, which is that the majority of those writers had never seen a production budget, nor even thought to ask to see one. So that was, I think, to the point here, just in being able to, to be familiar with that vocabulary is, it seems to be uh, pretty critical in terms of how you then interface with the production and the, and the institution. <coughs> oh, okay, five minutes, only five minutes. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure, so let's take this five minutes. Are there questions that you would like to pose to this esteemed panel of people with these great ideas? You're esteemed. Would you like to just go? <laughs> okay, there's here. Yeah, yes? Okay. I think it's you. Yeah. I, I just have a question, I guess, for just uh, everybody can anybody answer. Um, as a playwright, do you find yourself kind of trying to find the pulse of pop culture? Or do you kind of try and see your own kind of trends happening in the theater community or, or regional trends when you are creating new work? Um, for myself and my company, we're focused on the work, whatever the work it is. Um, but we also are very conscious, and I make sure I, I make sure I have young, young people connected to us and older, older people connected with us. So it's a whole spectrum of people that's all thinking about how to move forward. So if we're working on something that's a traditional theater piece, I'm also thinking outside of the box, how can we connect, like, you know, I keep saying Facebook and Twitter, but it's like Facebook and Twitter, what other ways can we impact um, in the way that younger people are receiving information and how they're responding to things. But I also make sure I got my older heads there who are like, from a traditional standpoint, like, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And so it's a whole team put together. You need to be aware of, you know, pop culture. It's there. You can't just act like it doesn't exist. And I think a lot of the problems with theater is we kind of ignored it or where you can see people trying to play catch up. And you're sitting there, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a theater where the theater itself has a hundred people in the room and then right next door is a space, kind of a multi-space like you're talking about, and there's 400 people floating around. And the theater is sitting on, how the hell did that happen? They have no idea how to get that people who are in that space in their theater. So I think you have to think on all those levels um, to move forward. Um, do you mean in terms of when you're writing the play, are you, are you gauging? Yeah, just kind of, are you kind of, I guess, gathering ideas or trying to connect on a certain pop culture level, or are you trying to more? I, I guess it really depends on the work. True, but uh, I feel like um, I feel like the part of your brain that writes is not, in terms of the part of your brain that produces can, you know, that thinks about what to do with this play that you've written can can try to connect in those ways. I feel like the part, you know, if you're connected with pop culture as an individual, you may write a work which turns out to be connected, or you may not. Um, I feel like like actively thinking about oh, theaters are doing this kind of play, or there seems to be this kind of thing, and then trying to write a play to that would be would be pretty deadening. <laughs> I'm going to take a question up here, gentleman with the hat. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I just perceive in this country a kind of lockdown on public space. Um, you have to get a permit to have a birthday party in Central Park now, for example, if you have more than 20 people. And uh, a lot of, especially I live in the South now, it's crazy to do, to try to do theater outside uh, or in like public assembly form. And I heard in everybody's ideal theater kind of like more about controlling an, in, an indoor space, kind of getting your space and controlling and kind of privatizing. And I'm just wondering if you have an experience in sort of making public spaces accessible, uh, bringing theater out uh, rather than getting people to come in. Thank you. I have absolutely no experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it can be great. There's a um, there's a company in New York called Downtown Art, uh, and they do site-specific stuff. They did a show, I think it was called the Waste Makers Opera, that began at the site of the Triangle Shirt Waste Factory. Um, and that building still exists uh, very close to Washington Square. So, yeah, I mean, dude, that's a great idea to think of public spaces as being an additional stage for the company that you have. You know, it's hard, though to do something outside. Um, it can go south, uh, it, can get, it, can, it can, it's very hard to do it, um, but it can be thrilling when it's good. 
I think if you're collaborating with um, people who also do outdoor, outdoor things, like a lot of community centers um, and artists, not artist groups, but community centers, things like that, use outdoor space to have things for kids and things like that. And we managed to collaborate with some, some politicians in the neighborhood who are progressive and they have things set up. And they can give you quicker and easier access to going out to um, a storefront and be able to have access to do things like that. I think if you include them in what's going on, you have easier access than opposed to just trying to run up there and just kind of plant your flag and get arrested. <laughs> Been there too. <laughs> I just like it when the audience is really close because it the the illusion of presentation is more is, is lesser. If it's really happening right there, then and it's really happening, and then maybe you'll have to rush the stage to make it stop. You know what I mean? So that's why I like small spaces. I'm, I started to work in bigger spaces, and it's really cool. It's really awesome, and and I, you make more money. Um, but uh, but the, I think there's magic in this small black box. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Any quick thoughts? Uh, okay, so we're going to wrap it up. I just want to thank all of you for being here, being attentive to and part of this conversation, and all of those guys too. Um, I want to thank uh, Amy Wegener, Sarah Lenny, Meg Fister, Emily Ruddick, and the rest of the ATL team. Sorry, ATL team for putting this together. And I want to thank amazing group of, of people with for their ideas. Thank you.